what is the secret sauce to brand success in a world of ever-changing tastes? Today, we talk chocolate innovation and the rocky road to long-lasting brand survival with Mark Attard, CMO and co-owner of multi-award winning dessert franchise, Sanchiro, to find out. So, thank you, Mark, for joining us today on ZX Factor. Thanks for having me. I have to say I'm a little bit biased because I am a fan of chocolate. <laughs> Most <laughs> people love it. Yep. So I sought you out, um, mm-hmm. but for more reasons than chocolate. Obviously, yep. Accenture is one of the most reputable companies and, and brands that we know of in Australia. And what you've done with Sanchuro over the time that you've grown this company, it's just evolved and we're just sort of seeing it evolve as we go. And I just thought we'd start with a little history. Sure. Can you tell us a little bit about the Sanchuro yeah, story? Absolutely. Um, I was one of the original founders of the business as such. So the, my business partner, Jiro Marucci, was travelling in Spain. Um, and just recognised that there was this uh, thing called a chocolateria in Spain which um, just struck a chord with him. He was a Melbourne based boy, we love food in Melbourne and he saw this chocolateria called San Ines in Madrid um, and it, it just struck a chord where he just thought there's nothing like this in the world. So um, at that point in time as well, it was just before Movida had won uh, Restaurant of the Year so Spain was becoming a bit of a flavour in, in, in the food scene. Um, so he came back to Australia and he's, he's an MBA, he's got a bit of a business background so he drafted a nice little uh, briefing document and he sent that out to a whole bunch of uh, design agencies and marketing agencies and one of them landed on my desk. So um, I had my own business at the, at the time which was a marketing agency and um, I saw this brief and thought it was well worded and it was interesting but I had existing clients and I was about to go to Spain funnily enough. Um, so I didn't, I didn't do anything with it till probably I had three hours left in the day and they thought, well, I've got time, I'll just fill in something up, kind of did, and wrote a bit of a response to it. Um, I came back from my holiday and then he's contacted me and said, I want to meet. Um, so then we sat down together and worked out what this brand was going to be because it was really just a piece of paper at that point in time. It's been nearly a, probably a year and a half before we opened the first store working on the brand. So um, it wasn't anything that happened by accident. There was been a lot of money and grit and research and hard work. Uh, well, yeah. you must have done something right because you've got, I think, 51... 51, yep, at the moment, yep. ...stores across Australia, yep. and uh, and that's happened over a space of 13, 13 years. years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I read this article recently and it piqued my interest about how yeah. businesses grow. You know, obviously, some fall off the cliff. Yeah, and growth's dangerous too if you don't handle it properly. Well, well Mark Leslie, who is... Uh, his professor at Stanford, and he he's described it sort of like in between that maturity and the initial growth phase is some kind of sweet spot yep. where businesses have a chance to take some more risks. So, where are you in Centuro now? We're I'd say we're probably on our second or third arc. Wow. Um, well, we've probably had we had an initial growth phase where we were, that we were adopted very quickly, in the, especially in the Victorian market. Um, we were new, there was nothing like us really competing with us in the space that we were in. Um, but, you know, Melbourne's a, you know, it's quite a fickle market too, so it's especially with food. So we grew very quickly, we got stores on the ground, um, and then we started to see that there was almost like a saturation point. And also recognising that markets like Melbourne aren't necessarily big fans of chains, so the more places you have, the less kind of, you know, the forefront of things, like the perceptions that you are. Um, so then we started going through um, rethinking where we put our stores. So we used to be in all the most trendy kind of spots, I guess, and then we started becoming a little bit more suburban. So we, we thought we'd recognise that families like to go to our stores. We weren't the hip sky on the block anymore, but we were still about quality and, and, and having a good experience. Um, so then there was a bit of a realignment there. So that, that was a shift in not so much the offering, but the positioning of the offering around the market. And then after that, you know, we started growing, and, and in many ways, because food was, you know, it was, it was kind of boom times in what we were doing, we would start adding things to our menu that were not necessarily super aligned with the brand, um, but would present you know, an opportunity to make a dollar, I guess, um, from that side. So we grew our menu to what was um, kind of described as cumbersome, but it was like a, a huge menu. From, from something that used to be a single page, we had a 20 page book of menu items with pictures and things like that. Um, and that worked for a while as well, but then you kind of become less less defined in your consumer's mind. Like, what are you there for? I mean, it's a sweet treat, but you know, are you Spanish? Are you white? Are you doing products for all over the place? So that lasted a while, and then over another period, we started recognising the sales trend was going down again, um, and that's where we probably went through our most um, rigorous realignment as a brand, where we 
we did a lot of navel gazing and recognising, okay, we, we can't just keep doing what we've been doing. Um, you need to understand that the consumer also has a place for you in their mind. So when, when you are something to someone, it's very hard to change that and become something else. So we had to get clear about defining who we were and understanding you know, what we meant to people. And really the, the, the thing we sort of hang our hat on was that we are actually a, a Spanish chocolate and churro joint. You know, at the end of the day, people thought it was for churro. All the rest of the stuff was kind of supplementary or um, bonus sales, I guess, in many ways, but not really what they weren't unique to us. Um, so there was a real focus on, again, consolidating that menu, getting it back to a simpler menu, but focusing on, all right, if we're going to own churros, let's own it like never before. And we started expanding our core product again. So now we went from something like 30% of our sales being around the churros component to now probably more like 45 to 50% of our sales are around churros. Um, and we do it in shapes and forms we never thought we'd do before. Everything from Sunday balls made out of churro dough to um, filled churros. Um, to different kinds of desserts incorporating churros to you name it. And that's kind of about, about getting back to corporate being more with your core, I guess is the thing about. Well, I'm sure yeah. I've had a lot of those. <laughs> 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 I have and I, I must say they're all delicious. <laughs> Speaking of your menu, mm -hmm. uh, you've gone down vegan road yeah, recently. Absolutely. And yeah. I have to say, I'm not a vegan, <laughs> um, but I love your vegan menu. Yeah. So, I'm not a vegan it? either. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that was, a, that was a bit of an insight that came from, uh, we've got a pretty big investment in data analytics within the company as well, so um, yeah, marketing is nothing without data to back it up, um, both quant and qual, but we, we really, we were kind of lacking that quant data. Um, so we, we put a guy on who's pretty hardcore data analytics, and he kind of drives all the insights that we then try and put a frame around when we get things. So one of the things that we recognise is that we were very, um, Seriously underperforming, I guess is anywhere you put it in the vegan segment. Um, we didn't have a lot of vegan options, there were some, but not that many. And it, a lot of it was because we had one particular product on the menu that actually kind of made a lot of the other churros products non-vegan because they were cooked in the same fryer. So whilst this product, which was the funnel cake that we stocked, um, was a good selling product, again, it's not super core, it wasn't really a churros based product, it was just another kind of dessert, it's not unique to us, other people do funnel cake. Um, we just made the call to say, all right, take that off the menu, um, suddenly we open up this whole other segment without having to change a heck of a lot, aside from a way of thinking. Um, so once we have the product base right, then of course that's nothing unless you have strategic targeting around how you're going to tell about it and how you're going to sell it. And, and again, uh, you know, vegan, um, being a vegan is usually a belief system, so it wasn't hard to then segment that, that database and, and speak to people like Peter, who were you know, very organised in the vegan front. Uh, and get into vegan like social groups, Facebook groups, those kind of things and start letting people know and then they spread the word. Um, I, I've never had so many people um, that I've met on the street as vegans then say to me, oh, Centura's doing a vegan menu now. Like that happened in the past. The fact that people didn't know we had it. Um, so it got, it spread like wildfire basically. And we won, um, again, this year we won the Peter Vegan Menu of the Year Award. And we're not even a vegan restaurant as such. We sell vegan products, but we're not solving vegan. Wow, congratulations, Thank by you. the way. <laughs> it's been a good year for awards. Yeah. It has, it has. We might touch on it a little bit more later on. I heard you talking about data analytics and yeah. how that's a big part of your strategy. And I did read that you have used uh, AI in yeah. your data insights to better understand your customers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was driven by our um, digital agency at the time, who's been bought out by somebody else now. Um, it's not a recommendation, we were actually the first client they had that actually said, yep, let's give it a go and see, see what happens. Um, what was interesting about it from our point of view is that we'll often, especially with digital campaigns, you'll create a campaign, you'll launch it, um, and then you'll watch it as you go, and because it's digital, you can tweak it on the go. So you keep optimising and optimising as you go. What was interesting about the approach with this was that we could we could basically create a campaign and a whole lot of campaign assets, especially um, taglines and, uh, and wording around things and put it into IBM Watson and see how that would measure against our database or the type of customer we were targeting before we even launched it. So it would actually give us responses. So uh, it was something like 500 um, uh, taglines were put into the system and we narrowed it down to about 50. So it was, it was for a campaign that we were doing that um, was about customization as much as possible. Um, so yeah, basically before we even got it into market in terms of efficiency and being able to target, we kind of had a pretty good idea how that performed before they had to perform, which is not anything I've ever been exposed to before. Um, yeah, so it was, it was at the time it was quite progressive, I know there's been some people doing it since. Yeah. 
Um, but again, I've never had so much attention given to me inside when we just we, we did this because no one really people people know or have heard of AI, but they don't really understand what it does or how it works. And at the moment, it still really needs a human component to it. You're still going to be generating. It's not creating a campaign for you, but you can do things like test before. Um, so it creates efficiencies that you wouldn't have had before either. Wow, so being a progressive sort of strategy, what makes you approach something and, and sort of like take something like that on board and, and invest money into something mm -hmm. like that as opposed to something else that's probably more tried and tested? More conventional. Yeah. Um, whilst I'm not young, um, I'd like to think I'm fairly <laughs> progressive in terms of the approach to things. Look, I think, I think by the nature of it, uh, we're, you know, we're owners of this business. You know, my, my partners and I are entrepreneurial by nature. And I think when you're, you're, when you're geared like that, you are always kind of naturally just looking for the next thing. You can't just sort of rest on your laurels. So recognising that we're playing in a space which is very much trend-based as well, um, we need to stay on top of it because the landscape's changed a lot. So you know, social channels are, are dominating our, our marketing mix at the moment. Uh, but understanding what's going to work in there is not necessarily clear-cut. You know, people are very fickle. Um, you might get people offside without even realising it. There's a lot of debate that goes on in there, the anonymous debate that always seems to happen on things, especially when you do things like vegan. Um, so I think just by the nature of the way this business has worked, well, you know, being bold and, and trying things has always been part of our DNA. It's not, it's not something we're going to shy away from because it's kind of actually what makes it a little bit more exciting as well. Um, when I started doing marketing, it was really you're going to do TV, radio, billboard, out of home. You know, it was a really simple marketing mix and it was you could get bored of that pretty quickly, I guess. It's, and if you didn't afford, if you couldn't afford TV, then it was limited even more. Um, whereas now, it's actually the whilst it's more fragmented than ever before, it's kind of more exciting than ever before as well because you're speaking directly to people. But understanding what's going to you know, float their boat is, is paramount. Yeah, well, it's brilliant because I mean, when you're talking marketing, you're talking not just about visual touch points. You're talking Absolutely. about I mean, we've got five senses here, yep. so I mean, like, obviously, you can yep. tap into the taste and the smell and, and things yep. like that. But you can, you know, you can really, it, there's so much opportunity to tap into so many uh, things out there. Absolutely. And it's great that you guys are, you know, taking, although you take risks, they're calculated risks. So I'm, I'm assuming. 100%. Yeah, because, yeah. Know, yeah. Um, the calculated risk is, is the core of our business at the end of the day. We, we made more, more of the less calculated risk in the early days of the business. Um, but they were all learnings as well. I, I, you know, you, if you didn't learn from them, you wouldn't have a business now. Um, I'd, I'd love to say we haven't thrown away a lot of money over the years, but there's, there's been an awful lot of money spent on things that haven't paid out. But uh, if you don't give it a go, you're never going to have, have a chance in business anyway. Um, I, I think the calculated risk from us is that we're all, um, we're all quite analytical thinkers in this business. Um, we value that. Um, you know, marketing is data driven. I'm created by, by a trade as well, so I've got a good sort of balance on that. Um, Jiro, our CEO, is incredibly good with data and incredibly good at um, left of field thinking and being able to garner insights from things that people don't generally see. So I think if you put that kind of together, you're always going to be challenging things. You're always going to be, okay, we're, we're bold and we want to try new things, but here's the underlying principles by which we're going to be trying it. Um, and we've become much better at that. The investment, like I said, in our data analyst is probably the best investment we've made in the company in the last 10 years, I'd say without a doubt. Wow. Well, it sounds like a fantastic team that you have. Yeah, it's pretty good. And, uh, and obviously, like, you are keeping goals. I mean, uh, you've just won an award. Yeah, franchise <laughs> already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Congratulations. So, uh, what's next for Sanctuary? Uh, so that's an excellent question. We've got we're actually in the middle right now of, uh, of our next sort of phase of strategy. So um, about two and a half, three years ago, we sat down and did a strategy plan for addressing the, the downturn in the market. Um, we've stabilised the business, uh, so we've got a good foundation again to start looking at the next phase. Um, and now it's really about okay, what's that next opportunity? And that's when you're talking about uh, arcs in a business. That's really what we're talking about here as well. Because if we had to stick with what we we're doing and just talking about bricks and water. Um, you know, food delivery has changed the game, and it's not changed it necessarily for the better in terms of business. You know, they, they, everyone knows they take a massive cut out of your, your bottom line. Um, so, but it's not going away. So you need to adapt to that. So, how do you maximise things like food delivery? How do we create an in-store experience through food delivery, for instance, when you've got a driver who's not really got much of a care factor taking your product and giving it to someone, and you're relying on it arriving in good condition and representing your brand as best it can. So, those are things that we look at. It could be. Um, it could be as, something as simple as creating another brand, working out a dark kitchen from your existing restaurant, 
for instance. So how do you maximise that bricks and mortar asset that you've got rent and you've got all the overheads of, but if people aren't coming in as much as they were before, they're ordering from home, well, I've got one rent, there's no reason I can't have another. It's still in a similar space. So things like that, just thinking a little bit left to centre. Um, you know, there's, there's other things we look at in terms of you know, getting the brand in different places, collaborations with other brands that are in like spaces but not necessarily competitive with us. That's probably something we weren't thinking about you know, five or six years ago. But um, right now, we've, we've got a, you know, we know we're the number one dessert brand on the market. Um, we know with Gen Zers that we are the 37th ranked brand in the country of all brands in the world. Um, and in the food space, QSR space, we're the number eight in the country with Gen Zers. So that's something, that's, that's valuable. So, that, that, so, so with that in mind, why won't we leverage it? Like why don't we just start going to other people saying, we've got this brand, people recognise this brand. Um, it's worth something as a brand on its own. It's, let's start thinking a little bit about how we can utilise that in other, other things. And any plans of taking it overseas? Or just... Yeah, it's definitely on the agenda. We've, we've talked about it a lot in the past, and we've actually, we've actually did that time board with some overseas stuff before and got a little bit burned, probably because we were a bit naive at the time, we partnered with the wrong people. Um, so you'll find there are actually some sanctuary stores in India, for instance, that have nothing to do with us anymore. Um, but having learned about that, you know, there, there are um, the way we approach now is very different. We were, we were, it was probably about eight years ago, we were a bit more naive about how the opportunity looked with that. Um, but again, you know, if we were moving to other markets, there would be a major project set up around looking at the other markets, evaluating the opportunities. Um, what are the cultural differences? What are the opportunities in terms of how they respond to the type of products we sell? Yada yada yada, um, and so it'll be. I'd be much more confident than you move overseas now. And we get literally we get offers every week from businesses, and always have since we've had the brand. Um, we're a franchise business, and we actually will probably get more master franchising inquiries for taking it overseas than we would for local like businesses. Oh, that's the value yeah, business, absolutely. People look at it. Um, so yeah, that, that's definitely on the cards as to which market and how we approach it. I'm not sure. Some key takeaways be, you know, of things that you've learned over the years. I put my, my younger naive eyes on, like, growth is dangerous. Um, so, unmanaged growth. Like, growth sounds great, it's one of those things you get opportunities to grow. Um, but especially in franchising, for instance, where you need to grow, if you don't manage that growth really carefully, it will cost you a lot. Things like that, you know, having all the ducks in a row, making sure you've got your systems in place. We were, we were kind of lucky in the respect like I spoke about our CEO, Jiro, he was, he's a very systems guy, um, so he loves the data and he loves all sorts of stuff. So we actually probably had more systems in place than most businesses of our size at the time. And I, I remember speaking to a lot of the bigger um, franchise systems out there and they were quite surprised often to find out the things we did have in place. I never thought they were good enough and he never thought they were good enough because they were the best we could do at the time. Um, but definitely now, making sure that you're across um, every metric in your business, which is important, from your cost of goods to your overheads to your wages costs, especially in the, in the food market, is, is so crucial. And having the, 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 the markers in place to recognise when they're going askew, absolutely. You know, if you're putting, building bricks and mortar, they're really expensive things. And so if you, if you go over budget or over time, it doesn't cost the person who's buying the store money, it costs us money. So we have to fund that. So things like that where we're not teaming up with the right people, not the right supplier base, all these things you kind of learn on the go. It all sounds rosy and beautiful, but guaranteed most of the businesses that are growing quickly at the start will probably be losing money in that process because they have to fund it out of their own pocket all the time. Um, and I, I look, I, I think without a doubt, the biggest thing that I've learned in business over the years is what to say no to. Um, because everything sounds great. Everything's an opportunity, and often they are opportunities. How to evaluate the priority in those opportunities and which ones you can actually focus on is something that just comes with time. You know, you, you, st you, you made your mistakes, you know, I did this last time, um, and it diverted my attention from something else, or I just didn't have the resource to execute it properly, all these kind of things. Everything sounds great, you know, on paper, executing is a different thing. So if you can't, if you can't get really concerted focus on the low-hanging fruits in your business and constantly apply the right resource to that, then you've got to get up now, basically. You've got to make sure that you do that the right way um, because it'll get to make or break, effectively. Well, some mm. definite wise words <laughs> <laughs> for any business, I think. I yeah. didn't have any great hairs before I used to say this. <laughs> well, look, I, I, I think it's a testament as to where the company is right now as to how many 
you know, you've built it and made the decisions that you have, good or bad, yeah, it's absolutely. brought you to yeah. this point, and I think that a lot of businesses out there can learn from your experience. Yeah. Uh, and look, thank you so much oh, for, for being with us and having a chat to us today. And um, you know, we hope to see you back maybe sometime in the future when you're, I don't know. Dominating a world of chocolate. Uh -huh. <laughs> You heard it first here yeah? <laughs> as the inspector. Um, but yes, thank you, Mark, and yeah, best of success with Tanjiro. Thank you. To connect with any of our guests or presenters, please visit the links provided.